All right, next up. So when Sean asked me for whatever reason, <laughs> temporary, temporary insanity or whatever, but uh, so when he asked me to, uh, to MC the conference, I asked like, well, what's the restrictions? Like, how do I need to behave? And he said one thing, no politics. Don't talk politics. So here to talk about Make Wi-Fi Great Again, Brian Harkins. Where's the magic clicker? I keep hearing about it. Is this, is this guy? Oh, there we go, there we go. So we've had a lot of great lectures this week, we've had really good classes. This isn't going to be that. No, because uh, everyone else was between you and a break, or between you and lunch, or between you and dinner. I'm between you and airplanes. So I'm going to try to make this fun and lighthearted, and uh, uh, we'll get out of here maybe a little early. I'll try not to go an hour, but if you've known me for more than a minute, you know it takes me that long to introduce myself. So it's going to be a, a little bit here, a little bit longer here. So first, uh, back when Wi-Fi was first coming out and people knew about it, it was out for a long time before most people knew it existed, right? In one form or another, there's always been some, something wireless. Back when it was great and new and exciting, we had this huge thing coming up behind us. We didn't know what it was. It was just this big thing coming. It was great, and we were all excited. And if you look, even behind the great thing, there's even more great things coming. But we didn't know what to do about it. But it was great and exciting because there wasn't a lot of it, and you could get away with you know, putting up one access point, no survey, no anything, just throw it up, and it was magic, and it just worked. Because you only had two devices connected to it, and you were the cool kid on the block with the new toy, and nobody else knew what it was. And then it started just you know, really becoming mainstream. And there used to be a, a saying, uh, wireless as demanded, but, but wired by default, right? And now it's kind of inverted. It's wireless by default, and wired as necessary to support the Wi-Fi. Because nobody wants to be tethered anymore. Uh, so it's just an important part of our lives. We think about it all the time. Uh, we have to have Wi-Fi connectivity everywhere. Anybody remember when you, you couldn't turn anything on on the airplanes? And then they figured out a way to make money on Wi-Fi, and it's OK now. So we can turn Wi-Fi on, on the planes. It's not going to be great, but there's some Wi-Fi-like substance that you get charged for, right? So this was coming up behind us. And if you look really closely at the roadway, not everything coming behind us was great because there's some stuff on that road I don't want you know, anywhere near me, <laughs> especially not in that elephant volume. I don't want that at all. There were very few users, and part of that was just the cost of entry. And I put a price tag on this card because that's what I felt about it when I had to buy these cards years ago. It's like, oh my god, just look at this $150 for what? Isn't that already built into my laptop? Why do I have to get this? My ethernet port's built in. And now it's all built in. And you got, you know, as we've seen throughout the, the presentations, Wi-Fi everything. You know, Wi-Fi chips for your dogs, Wi-Fi uh, and watches and refrigerators that tell you when you're out of milk. You know, that's a lot of stuff. But back then, just the cost of entry for the client was expensive. And not everyone had it. Because back then, most employees got what? A desktop. They weren't getting laptops. Anybody get issued a new desktop at work when they started a new job in the past five years? A couple of you? Well, that's because you do things that need a better video card or you need more memory or a larger hard drive. But most of us, you get, here's your laptop. And what's in that laptop? It's integrated Wi-Fi. It's on the system board. We can't even call it motherboard anymore. It's on the system board. It's just integrated into the board. It's not even a um, PCIe Express something stuck in there anymore that you can replace. It's all there. But back then, nobody was going to buy it, especially home users. And then it started getting a little bit more affordable, where you could start buying things. And like I said before, it just worked. The magic was there. And, and that's one of the best things about Wi-Fi, and also one of the worst things about Wi-Fi. It'll kind of work, and if the users don't know enough to know that it should be better, they'll put up with it for a while. And they'll just keep putting up with it, where it's, it's slow, you've got more and more people connecting. Uh, you've got devices that sometimes are more capable than the access points that are supporting those devices. And it's just, it just still works, kind of. You know, for those of us in the industry, you know it's, it's not working as well as it could. 
but it, it, it worked. So people just don't complain. And years ago, nobody knew any better because we didn't have the device density that we have today. And back then, in fact, we called it user density because it was kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, right? One user, one laptop. And then they didn't really use the Wi-Fi if they were sitting at their desk because they had docking stations because they wanted to have their printer and their monitor or they at least plugged in Ethernet because, oh, that Wi-Fi thing, I don't want that. But it, just, it was just working and it got better uh, and better and I've had conversations with people that want to know why it took so long to design and deploy Wi-Fi because all they did was go out to the office supply store and get a, a small router and plug it up at home and it just worked. So that's great for you and your one or two devices at home but it's not great for everyone around you. And plus, when you do that, everyone else does it and the whole neighborhood's on channel six. And that, that's not pretty. But it still kind of worked because of low volume. Low volume. Over time, everyone needed Wi-Fi. We had to have it. You know, everything ships with it. You, you just have to have it. My uh, six-year-old granddaughter, when she was three, she was grabbing my iPad, logging herself in because I wanted her to. I just showed her the code, just straight up the middle. There's your code. And she was downloading her own videos and things and just expects everything to be wireless and wants to connect to the tablets and things. And it's scary because when I was her age, I had G.I. Joe and Hot Wheels. And, and now she's, she's all over it. And then we had just the explosive growth of Wi-Fi. And I don't know why that slide just dashed my, uh, it's W-Fi today. And it's a whole different word. But, you know, warehousing, logistics had to have it, home use, conference rooms, small office, home office deployments, enterprise use. And when the enterprise really started adopting Wi-Fi, that's when we had to start focusing on making it good and making it work because you had so many devices that need to be on the network at once and it's mission critical stuff. And it's getting in the way of money. And when things get in the way of money, suddenly they get attention. So Wi-Fi is just, it's just everywhere. Uh, planes, buses, uh, it's not just uh, for coffee shops anymore. You know, it, it's, it's all over the place. So it's expected. And I think Alexandra mentioned this yesterday. It's like utilities. When you go into a building, you expect electricity. You expect water. You expect gas. And now uh, we're expecting free Wi-Fi. I just expect it, expect it to work. Uh, remember when uh, hotels first started rolling out Wi-Fi? It was in the conference rooms and maybe the lobby. And then they started putting it in guest rooms, like, oh, I've got Wi-Fi. I started trying to look for hotels when I was booking for travel that offered Wi-Fi, just so I could have it. I was sitting in a hotel in Basingstoke, England, and they had Wi-Fi only in the lobby. And I'd been there several times. They knew who I was, and it was just in the lobby, and I overheard people talking about how bad the Wi-Fi was, and they couldn't connect anywhere. And it was an old uh, uh, Colubris 420, I think, just one hanging in the lobby, and you could see it. And I looked at it, and I knew immediately why it was bad. It wasn't the vendor. It wasn't the fact that it was only G. It was the fact that somebody painted the wall, and instead of taking the access point down to paint behind it and then put it back up when the paint dried, they just bent the antennas down and painted around it. So now they're covering the floor and the ceiling, and they're not covering the room. So I asked them if I could just go over and flip up the antennas. Uh, and, and it got better. And now they have deployed Wi-Fi throughout the entire hotel, and, and they've got good Wi-Fi. And they've gone from just saying we have Wi-Fi in hotels to having Wi-Fi that works because they're buying enterprise quality gear, they're going and putting some design in, in nicer hotels, and they're planning for the business travelers, and they're actually offering it for free instead of charging you in a lot of, a lot of places now because it's become something that it's expected at the hotel. I expect, do you, you remember when you were younger and you'd be on a family road trip and you'd drive by a hotel and it had a big sign out front that said HBO? It, it's just, and now you, you, you expect that now. Wi-Fi's gotten that way. I expect to have Wi-Fi when I go into a hotel. I, I do. And the more expensive the hotel is, the more likely I am to have to pay for that Wi-Fi, right? Or log in for free and the captive portal page says, oh, if you want a faster experience for an extra $29.95 a night, you can actually have you know, usable Wi-Fi. But it's there. Everything was, was getting better and better over time. And we, we actually started paying attention to make it better, even in hotels. But then this happened. The unlicensed and the uneducated meet. People think they can start ripping out their ABG access points, and I'll just throw an N in the same spot. It's a different technology, and you can't do that. And the clients have changed over time, and there are more of them than when you hung up that ABG access point five years before N came out. So when the uneducated meets, 
the unlicensed, you get stuff like this. Anybody ever go to badfight.com? Uh, one of my favorite websites. It's just absolutely great. What purpose does wrapping an AP in aluminum serve? Or al aluminum for you, those of you from England. Uh, so, and then the cans, what's that? And up above the wire, and, and I've seen ugly, ugly things like that years ago. And now it's just, it's just back, it's back. I was doing a wireless vulnerability assessment for an auto parts manufacturer just outside Munich back in 2007. They were using uh, symbol access, no, symbol barcode scanners, Cisco APs, and Spectralink phones. But they were all B, and everything should just work, right? It's B, it should all work. And they were wondering why they kept dropping phone calls. I didn't see anything in packets. Everything looked, looked fine. But then I walked through the plant, and I saw all the access points hung on chains from the ceiling. And every time they'd open the dock doors, the APs would swing back and forth like this. Coverage, no coverage. <laughs> coverage, no coverage. And, and they're wondering why they don't have phones, right? And, and that kind of thinking has is, is kind of crept back into us because there, there's such a high demand for Wi-Fi, and people like you that get it, we're just in a small number. So we have people that have never done Wi-Fi before that are great routing and switch and great, great uh, desktop support people suddenly having Wi-Fi thrust upon them is one more thing they have to do. And they do kind of a no survey survey, just hang it and run and rip and replace things. And I, I know somebody had this on their slide earlier, I think it was Keith, where they had uh, an antenna pointing where they wanted coverage. I've seen that before, that's real. So what did they just point? They pointed the donut hole where they wanted coverage and they're getting nothing. Uh, you don't do antenna diversity for coverage. You know, that, that's done to mitigate multipath back on ABG stuff, but now N and AC with MIMO love it. So why not, why not you leave it? And then you wind up with this stuff. And, and those are not, you know, 2003, 2002 photos. Uh, and that, that's real world stuff. And, and maybe you want to keep your own photos as you start doing surveys. And it's, oh, don't do this. This is crazy. Or you get a picture of a really good one. And I, I was blessed uh, to work with the Navy once. I got to de help design some of the uh, uh, wireless intrusion prevention for the subs. And you think about all that metal and everything around there. How are you going to get everything through there? But it's just like we just heard in a previous uh, lecture, know the Fresnel zone. Use the right antennas. You know, plan things, things right. And the magic stopped working. That's one reason, unplanned Wi-Fi. When you let it grow on its own organically, like we did years ago with one AP in the conference room, and then, oh, that magic stuff, I gotta have it back here by my desk, and I'll plug my own in. It's horrible. You've gotta really know what the clients are. You've gotta design for the needs of the clients and the environment in which they work. And if you design around those two things, you'll have a great design every time. But if you just take into account half of that, it's just not gonna work. You've really gotta do it. Unplanned growth and device usage. Who allows BYOD on their networks now? Lots of people, right? What was one of the first things we discovered when we turned on BYOD, besides all the security risk and, and they're getting into things from their phone? No IP addresses. Somebody said it. You didn't increase the size of your DHCP scope, and if you're one of the first 10 people at work with your you know, 15 devices out of your bag turning them on, you'll get an address, and everyone else will make a layer two connection, but they can't connect at layer three, and where's the problem? According to the user, it's Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi sucks, I can't connect. It's not a wireless problem, is it? It is, because that's how they're connecting. It doesn't matter if the cause is not in Wi-Fi, since the user is connecting in Wi-Fi, the perception is the problem is Wi-Fi. So when you start rolling those things out, you've got to you know, plan for that growth. Unplanned wireless by default with wired to only support Wi-Fi. What that means is that I know I need Wi-Fi. I know I need all these runs out there, but then you don't do anything to upgrade the switches. You don't do anything to add more switches and add redundance for inside that so I have redundance for the switches. The Wi-Fi is working, but something went wrong with the switch. And now everything from the switch down is out or the router down is out. And you know, crazy firewall rules and things that stop that. We talked about BYOD. Uh, the way that we used to use bring your own device was I want to connect my phone to the company network or even just the company guest network because I don't want my 3G plan to be saturated with data usage and I have to pay an up fee every month for uh, going over my data plan. So it's changed. It's not that anymore. It's I have my own phone and I want to do work on my own phone. At first, companies were resistant to that, 
but then when they realized I don't have to buy that phone, the employee already bought their own phone, and it's their phone, so I don't have to teach them how to use it, then it was embraced. But if you don't plan for that, if you don't think about how I'm going to onboard these devices for security reasons, how I'm going to support you know, three and four devices per user instead of the one that I've issued them, then you're going to continue having problems. Internet of Things and business and manufacturing, is, it's e everywhere, wearable devices, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, and it's all Wi-Fi, and unfortunately, it's all 2.4. And there was, I don't know if you're following the conference on Twitter, uh, after all the talk about Wi-Fi is dead, my, my reply was, Wi-Fi in 2.4 is not dead, but the way we used to use 2.4 is. We need to come up with a better, more intelligent way of using that spectrum, uh, just to take care of the things that need to work in that space. 802.11 has been and will always continue to be a moving target. That's why we have amendments. We're in double letter amendments, and it's just, who, who knows when triple letter amendments are coming, right? Or maybe we have to switch to some kind of letter and numeric format. It's just going to be nuts because it's always changing because our needs are always changing and our demands are always changing. And a lot of the needs are real, but a lot of the demands are just, I want more, I want more. You know, faster and cheaper drives IT, right? And everybody wants faster and cheaper, but when you think about what most people are doing, do they need the multi-gigabit speed of AC for most users? No but they want it because marketing put it on the box. I, I can do this. So let's make Wi-Fi great again and bring back the magic and not be looking at what's coming from behind us already. Let's plan ahead. Let's look at, what, at what, where we want to go and start planning for what we think needs to be there rather than trying to backfill every little nook and cranny in previous amendments. You know, when 802.11n was really coming out, I'd have people ask me, when do you think we're going to have 4x4x4 in everywhere? You won't because AC is already in the works, and if I'm a chipset vendor, I'm not going to make any 4x4x4 clients when I'm busy making AC clients to sell what people are demanding and wanting now, even though they don't truly need much of it. So with some magical explanations from this guy, we can understand more about what's happening and what's going back and forth between the devices and, and really educate the consumer. I, I think anybody that is uh, em, deploying Wi-Fi or selling Wi-Fi, it's not transactional business. Transactional business, I answer the phone, oh, you need 15 of those, I'll ship them to you. Here's the price, give me your PO, your credit card number, whatever. Every Wi-Fi deal is consultative, right? I need to you know, find out if you really need 15. Maybe you need 100, maybe you need two. But I can't just say, you know, you need this. You know, unless I'm working at a distributor and I'm dealing with one of you guys that, you know, really knows what you're doing, you tell me, Brian, I need four of these. I'll send you four. I won't even ask you if you need five or three. I'll just send you four because that's what you asked for. But it really is a, an educational sale, even internally. Because sometimes you, you know that budget is always an issue, but having people that understand the technology will help you get around some of that. Knowing that you might need 10 or you might not need any at all is just reconfiguring things sometimes can help. And one of the, the issues I find when troubleshooting is that it's not always the client, it's not always the AP, it's not always just the environment or the wired side. Sometimes it comes back to something very basic, a lack of design. Nobody thought about what they did when they deployed it, or nobody thought about it as it changed over time. Does everyone watch the same TV shows you watched when you were a kid? No. You're, You've, you've grown, you, you do other things, you read different books, you go to different movies, you listen to different music, and you know, it's been great, the music here has been great all week, because it reminds me of high school, but when you, you, you listen to the same things over and over, you're not growing, and we've grown, and we've grown in Wi-Fi too, so you can't keep planning the same old, you know, put an AP here, put an AP there. Anybody remember the W patterns in warehouses? Yeah, just put in a double W pattern, the warehouse will work fine. Might still get, a bit, get away with that if, if you're still using old barcode scanners, but when you're using scanners that have you know, video capability, that have you know, uh, different emails and things on them, you've got to do something better than just zigzagging through in the old days of coverage, and when coverage is all we needed. So we just have to keep working on it and working on it. So it's gonna be more work on our own to help make Wi-Fi great again. We're getting there. You know, maybe you've learned a lot this week that you can apply it at work on Monday, but we're, we're really getting to where we're, we're trying to make it better again but we're still fighting the same people, the users, that don't understand that it's not just magic. There's a lot of stuff going on with it, and it's not just gonna work. 
you've got to have some understanding of physics. You know, things are just going to work. So what's required? Site surveys. Do them. Don't let people tell you, oh, I don't need a survey. Anybody's customer ever tell them you don't need a survey, just hang them up. Just put them where I tell you. That's pretty common. And, and what they're really saying is I don't want to pay for it. And what they're saying is I don't want to pay for it up front because that is, you know, a, a capital expenditure. I got to buy this stuff. I got to buy your services. But on the operational side, I must have plenty of budget because every day that phone's going to ring on the help desk. I've got users that can't work. I've got customers that can't buy from me because I didn't build things the right way in the first place. How much does that cost? I don't know. But that cost is going to be there every day from now to the end of that network. But the survey is going to be up front. And it's actually going to save money in the long run. So do the survey. You know, with predictive design, you've got capacity planning now. So it's not just uh, put an AP here because the walls are going to do this. It's about the number of devices. And not just the number of devices. What are those devices doing? You know, that, that's important. So you've got to plan for applications. Because sometimes the application may require more than Wi-Fi can provide. Or maybe it's you know, just nothing. It's a light application. You can get by with not as heavy a, a Wi-Fi deployment. Look at your predicted growth. It's great to build for what's there today, but as I grow, I need to be able to automatically accommodate that. Now, years ago, uh, when people started moving into five, I started planning for five. And I started planning not just for five gigahertz, but I started planning for voice in five gigahertz and resiliency and roaming. So you look at you know, secondary coverage and tertiary coverage from the APs in case an AP goes down. I've got to have some mission critical things working. And if you deploy in hospitals or other places where you know, somebody's life's on the line, if I can't get the information fast enough, you, you start thinking about that. Uh, SSID usage, chipset vendors, oh, my chipset will take 32 SSIDs or 16 SSIDs. I would love for one of them to show me one AP in a Faraday cage. Let's make it fair. There's no r noise or anything interfering. Put one AP in a Faraday cage with 32 or 16 clients, one connected to each SSID and trying to pass traffic. It's just not going to work. Because uh, each SSID is a logical access point that has to use the same physical hardware to work. So you want to keep the number of SSIDs down to something usable. Maybe 2 and 5 and 2 and 2.4. In 5, you'd have corporate high speed and corporate voice because you may need different security on them because some of the phones may not support or roam well with 802.1x. And in 2.4, you have your guest network and maybe corporate legacy or corporate BYOD. And then you still got four SSIDs on one access point, but you're dividing them up on the, among the radios. It's just a smarter plan. Use the strongest security possible. And the reason I say the strongest security possible instead of the strongest uh, is because some of the devices just can't cut it. You know, they can't do everything and still be able to roam and work the way they need to. Or maybe it's a legacy device that costs, you know, $1,500 or $2,000 a piece, and you've got hundreds of them and there's no budget to immediately replace the device. So you put them on a corporate legacy network with the lower security, and then use the higher security on the corporate fast network. And then you control where they go by you know, good VLANs and good security on those VLANs. Avoid the overpopulated 2.4 space when possible. Not completely, because if we all jump out of 2.4 into 5, 5 will very rapidly become today's 2.4. So we still want to use it when, when we can, and for the things that make sense to be in 2.4, but I, you know, I wouldn't plan for a brand new 2.4 everything because most client devices, other than you know, the IoT things and the small stuff, are coming with dual-band radios, which they couldn't years ago because they were very expensive. Use channel bonding wisely, and low-density areas are not at all. Just because the box says it'll do 160 megahertz wide channel and it'll give you this massive data rate doesn't mean you're actually going to get that in a live deployment. And we've heard discussions this week about, you know, maybe I go back to just 20 megahertz wide channels. And there's a good reason for that, because if I have narrower channels, I'm not going to be bothered as much by neighboring APs. I'm not going to bother them as much. And I'm going to have more APs that I can deploy, so my collision domains are smaller, so each client gets more opportunity to talk. So I'm giving them more airtime. Even though they're given a smaller or lower data rate, since they're given more opportunity to speak, their overall throughput will go up. But do use channel bonding when you can. Low density environments uh, where you can get away with it, you don't have too many neighbors around you, it works. Works great. But you still have to take into account the clients. Will the clients bond out to that magic 160, or do the clients only go to 40? So if you know your clients and design around that, it'll really help there. Train the users and set up proper user expectations. 
You know, a lot of times the users are buying into the marketing hype because they've been walking down the aisle at the office supply store and it says 20 million gigawatts or whatever on the box and they just want to use that and they can't because their client device won't support it. And the same thing at work. You know, you've got to you know, tell them what the expectations are and, and for Wi-Fi in general and what the capabilities are. So if they know those parameters, they're not going to complain as much. They'll, they'll know more about what's going on and if you train them properly, maybe they'll behave properly and, and realize what's going on. Uh, one organization I used to work with, we were um, all supposed to be on this online conference with you know, offices in another country and we were told if you're going to be on the bridge, make sure you come to the conference room because our pipe coming into the building wouldn't support you know, 100 people all watching the same video stream at the same time. We try to go in the conference room. So you have to have those kind of expectations leveled for, for the users so they'll know what's there and build around the capabilities of those clients in the environment. And honestly, if you do those two things, it'll be stellar. So this is a shameless plug. Uh, I know David said it was his book, but it's mine. My name's on it too. Uh, so th there it is. And I'm trying to keep this a little short. I know I'm way short uh, because I'm between you and the airplanes. So uh, I'll hang around. If anybody has any questions, I'll be back at the Echohal booth. Uh, so you can, you can find me if you need to. Uh, thank you all for listening. And I think, do we need to grab UC and have him come back up and tell us to go home? Or <laughs> who comes next? Here he comes. And that's the boss, so I have to, have to hide now. Thank you, guys.